Anybody else in? Welcome. Uh, welcome to this uh, public meeting of the Board of Trustees of the Palo Alto Unified School District. Uh, I wanted to call your attention to the um, instructions that are printed in the agenda about uh, um, opportunities for public comment, either during open forum or on particular items, uh, and you'll see the, the procedure there. The board um, uh, met in closed session uh, this evening and took one uh, reportable action in the case of uh, DK versus PAUSD, uh, which is PAUSD-GC-2022-23.01. The board voted unanimously to reject the claim. The uh, next item on our agenda is the approval of the agenda order. Is there a motion? I move we approve it as presented. I'll second. Moved and seconded. Uh, student board members, uh, nice to meet you. <laughs> so sorry I wasn't here last time to see you. Uh, student board members, preferential vote. Aye. Aye. Uh, board members, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The agenda order is adopted. The next item on our agenda is student board member reports. Um, Ms. Pan. Hello, yes. Um, Ms. Pan, I, sorry. Yeah, no Put my glasses on. Um, hi, everyone. I'm still Daniel Pan. Um, <laughs> um, anyways, in the past few weeks, uh, Gunn has held many school events um, over the course of um, a few weeks. Um, first, we had a senior assembly where all of the seniors gathered together to listen to a presentation prepared by the Gunn staff about the senior checklist and what to do um, to graduate from Gunn. Next, we had our freshman elections for our student council. So we elected the new president, vice president, and site council reps um, to the uh, class, and we have started transitioning them into the group. And we started holding Stanford parking sessions where each grade um, at Gunn, along with Pally, sold Stanford parking tickets, which helped uh, fundraise for the school. We also started accepting applications for fall clubs and recently closed the forum to start to finalize the list. Um, along with the fall club applications, we also had our back to school night. Um, student council members scattered across the campus to guide any parents um, that needed help finding their way to a classroom. And overall, it went pretty smoothly. Um, and following the back to school theme, Gunn also hosted its back to school social a few weeks back um, where the Gunn band performed a couple of cool songs like um, don't Stop Believing, I think that's what it's called. Um, and attendees could get um, food from food trucks and um, overall it was a pretty fun event. Um, and as we all know, the heat has been getting um, pretty bad these past weeks. So the PTSA was kindly enough um, to offer free drinks um, at the senior quad for any students to pick up. And they were ice cold, so it really helped. Um, we also had our lockdown drill last Wednesday to ensure that um, all of our new students um, understood the procedure if something like that happened. Um, and also, all of our grades have started to prepare for homecoming. And air bands have started, um, floats have started too. Um, this year, the homecoming theme for Gun is Gun Inc. So each um, dress up theme is related to Gun as if like Gun was a company, um, including like cafeteria. Um, company retreat, hobbies off the clock, and different types of bosses. <laughs> um, and of course, the most important thing was our homecoming reveal video. Um, and if you guys have watched the show, um, we did an office parody <laughs> where um, our ASP president played as Michael Scott, um, who was the main character, and I, I also got the chance to play as Dwight Schrute. So that was very <laughs> entertaining. Um, you can find the video on the Gun ASB or Gun SEC um, YouTube channel. Um, we also had our Gun Pally football game last Friday. Um, to all of our surprise, Pally won um, with 41 <laughs> points to our zero points. Um, but anyways, all jokes aside, it was a very fun event for everyone, and um, a special thanks to the dance and cheer teams from both schools to collaborate together to give us a really cool performance to watch during halftime. 
Um, however, there was also an incident um, where Pali students um, rushed to the gun stands. And thankfully, um, the staff um, made a very um, improvised call to stop all the students from um, whatever they were gonna do. Um, and I think as um, the gun community um, in general, um, we were very thankful to the staff that um, stepped in and stopped it because we really didn't know like what they were gonna do. Um, so we're thankful that we, we got out of the um, game safely. Um, and yeah, um, lastly, um, there are also some other school events that are happening soon. So we had a volleyball game against Pali um, on Thursday night and also another football game against San Mateo High School on Friday. Um, for school events, we also have the fall club fair coming up this week and also at Gun Sidelands where um, students will be performing their own songs and performances. So yeah, that's it for me. Thank you. Um, Ms. Sia. Yeah, thank you so much, Daniel. I actually did get to see the Hoko reveal video. It was really great. Uh, Daniel was definitely one of the stars of the show. I thought it was really entertaining. <laughs> Um, to introduce myself, hi, I am still Johanna Sia. Uh, just for pronunciation, it's like Joe and Hannah put together and Sia like Sia later. Um, I'm also glad to be back for my second board meeting. Um, after over a month of school, Pally is returning back to its usual activity and spirit. Our student activities have also been quite busy, especially with the coming of early spirit week in just two weeks. Uh, we welcomed our new freshman officers, David, Kiara, An, and James to ASB just a few weeks ago and kicked off back to school night for parents a few days after that. The next week greeted us with blazing heat, as Daniel said, and I think it's safe to say that all of Pali were grateful for the initiative of PTSA, Mr. Klein, food service, and ASB volunteers for, for, for providing and handing out popsicles to students and staff during lunch. All of our fall clubs, which totals up to around 140, were approved and will be presented to the school during our two-day club event, which will be tomorrow and Thursday. In regards to Spirit Week, ASB has been hosting spirit dance practices for every class and designing our floats and t-shirts in preparation. Personally, I think our senior dance and float are going to be spectacular, especially since there are so many talented people pitching in and just making things happen. We have also been planning for our homecoming dance, which will be on October 1st. I want to give a special shout out to all the volunteers who helped lead the parking fundraiser, as Daniel mentioned, for the Stanford versus USC game. Um, from what I've heard, they were really dedicated through all the chaos of a massive football game with like thousands of cars and contributed towards an amazingly successful yield. As some of you may know, the Stanford parking fundraiser is really important for Pali and Gunn to fund our diverse clubs and student activities. So I just wanted to make sure that I could recognize these individuals for their contribution. School life is getting up to the usual swing of things with in-focus broadcasts starting to air their uh, morning announcement episodes complete with comprehensive announcements about ASB and school events, as well as like reviews of the latest movies. Campanile's first issue was released just this Monday, and a stream of articles have already been featured online from our numerous publications. Our speech and debate team has, had quite, um, has been quite active since the start of the school year, with our varsity dinner being held in the MAC a few weeks ago, and our novice night actually happening right now. Over the weekend, our debaters participated in the UK online season opener tournament with public forum team Sophia Kim and Sarah Beth Huang making the top 16. Robotics and Sayoli are also recruiting new members and expanding the reach of their amazing programs. Pali Theater's production of Radium Girls has been fully casted and has started rehearsals already, and the design team got the chance to have a production meeting yesterday. Tonight is Drama's 12th Annual Drama and Desserts event for students and their families to learn more about the amazing Pali Theater department. And of course, I do have to talk about the gun Pali football game as promised. I actually got to go with Daniel on Friday night and got to be in the gun stands, which was a little different. I got to be a bit of an imposter, but I thought it was kind of fun. Um, I just want to start off by saying that the athletes, cheerleaders, and dancers all did amazing, especially the Pally Gun cheer dance performance during halftime. It was so good. Um, they just brought such an amazing, like, unifying energy, and it made us, like, just really excited. A lot of us were cheering and just, like, generally hyping them up. I do also want to address um, the largest part of the game might be like the elephant in the room. 
as the student board representative, I do want to personally like apologize and just make it clear that the actions that I witnessed at the football game, if you don't know, like the taunting, derogatory comments, shouting, and the storming of the gun student section was just incredibly obnoxious and disrespectful and inexcusable. It was unnecessary and inconsiderate, not to mention unfair to all the hardworking students and adults who made the game possible and to those who are just receiving unwarranted blame. Um, personally, I'm just like really fed up with this sort of culture at Pali being here for four years, especially like in ASB, we are getting a lot of backlash from our own classmates. It's just overall a very frustrating experience. Um, of course, I want to acknowledge that students at the football game represent a very small percentage of the Pali population, with the majority being very kind, hardworking, and considerate people. And I also know that a lot of Pali students are on the same page about this, and that we as a community can collectively foster a culture of consideration and encouragement. I know that as student leaders, we want to make this culture happen, and we have created a plan both short-term and long-term to not only make amends, but prevent this sort of event from ever happening again. I know I want to do whatever is possible to prevent this in the future, and I know that this sort of positive change is definitely possible. I've seen it happen in the team building, during float building, through the encouragement that comes from those involved in our Pali community activities, and through the excellence I see in Pali students who are contributing to make a difference. I know that we as Pali students can do better. I always wanna make sure that my reports represent Pali and that they're honest about the perspective of students. So I hope I got to convey that tonight. Uh, thank you. Thank you both for your leadership uh, in your school communities. Uh, the next uh, item on our agenda is the report of the superintendent of schools, Dr. Austin. Yeah, first of all, Johanna, that was beautifully done. Nice job. Um, so we have a couple items tonight that are fun, align perfectly with our goals, and are worth celebrating our progress. And I'm looking forward to those reports later in our agenda. But for now, I need to focus on two things that are in opposition to our goals and require our attention and clear resolve. The first involves the incident that we've already spoken about in the final minutes of our football game between Gun and Pally. As many have read, at this point over 100 Pally students left the stands and entered the gun stands as a mob. I've reviewed the video and find it disturbing as a former coach, activities director, principal, and now superintendent. In fact, I've never seen anything like it. And I've seen a lot of games, a lot of schools, both as a player and all these other roles. But after I sat back, Mr. Klein and I, who have had multiple conversations, and Mr. Klein and I have a shared uh, way of looking at this, I tried to put myself in the, in the place of the families that were in the stands with young children or grandparents. I thought about how easily a student could have thrown a water bottle or something else in a confined space that would have started a fight or a mass event. I thought about how close we were to complete chaos. Think about this, one firecracker, one hard push, one angry, scared adult, one scared child who went running into, into something they didn't understand. I've spent time with our two principals since the game. Ultimately, we count on both of them to work directly with our students and the staff. And it's clear that some students like our ASB and other groups realize the significance of what happened. I think we just heard that. It is, however, equally clear that others see no problem with what happened and cannot comprehend why there would be consequences of any kind. The actions at the game were as egregious as I have seen. The idea that anyone would defend them is baffling. Our league sent a memo to all member schools today, just a couple hours ago, outlining potential sanctions to the Pali, uh, Pali High School. Part of the rationale, and I debated if I was gonna say this or not, but I'm gonna say it because it's true. Part of the rationale is that Pali has a history of poor behavior at games. That's stated in the memo from the league. Our students may learn that reputations matter and that inappropriate behavior is not protect, protected, condoned, or free of consequences. 
in this case, in this, people really need to hear this. I, I think we're so sheltered here sometimes. In this case, 11 other principals will decide the sanctions for our school. And they don't care about Pally. They don't care about the good things. They care about what they've seen too many times. This is in addition to any self-sanctions that are imposed by the Pally administration, which we're still working through. I'm gonna shift gears because they're very related. We're a couple weeks away from what is locally known as egg wars tied to Spirit Week at Pally. And I am honestly dismayed that adults condone the mass vandalism of our city and defend it as a harmless tradition. Privilege can be defined as a special right, advantage, or immunity granted to the avail or granted or available only to a particular person or group. In the case of egg wars, participating students believe that their actions are granted immunity from any consequences. They are told and believe that it is their right. This is not a feeling held by students or other groups at other schools or communities. By every aspect of the definition of privilege, our students are demonstrating their privilege at the highest level. Purchasing stacks of eggs to throw at people, cars, homes, or other sub, uh, objects is not a right and carries no immunity. It is vandalism and contributes to a negative reputation. Egg wars will be treated this year for what they are. They are not cute. They are not a right. Our team will fully support any steps taken by the Pali administration to deter the destruction of our community and will also support any corrective measures they see fit if the event occurs. This is not a debate. We stand with the Pali administration, local law enforcement, residents, and many students who feel it is time to move in a positive direction. I think it's important that you know where your leaders stand on this issue, and I hope this was clear enough for everyone. With so much to celebrate and appreciate, I am looking forward to cleaning some things up so we can realize our full potential as a school district and community. I'm, I'm uh, equally aware that we have a lot of great students who want to make good decisions and we have a lot of people who support this. Unfortunately, the reputation just keeps getting more and more evidence to support and we need to stop it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Austin. Uh, next, uh, next item on our agenda is open forum. Open forum is an opportunity for members of the public to address the board on topics uh, that are not otherwise on the agenda. Uh, and you can sign up for open forum uh, using the process in the agenda. Our practice is to take um, uh, additional speakers on an item, including this one, until the first uh, speaker has finished speaking so that we can gauge how many uh, speakers we uh, have in total so that we can apply our uh, rules around time and number of speakers. Um, so if you'd like to speak on this or any other item, I encourage you to go ahead and um, sign up using that method. Uh, the first uh, speaker for open forum will be uh, Aether Zabel. And I'm going to issue a blanket apology for the mispronunciations I'm going to make for everybody's name. That was pretty good. Um, and you can come up to the podium so that the mic can pick you up. Thank you. And so you'll have three minutes, uh, as will everyone on open forum, I think. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Ether Zabel, and I'm a sophomore at Gunn High School. Uh, and today, actually, I noticed that the elevator permits for one of the elevators, namely the one in the uh, wellness center building, it's used to reach, among other things, the nurse's office, the wellness center, the college help office, and the counseling department. Uh, the elevator's permits are more than three years expired. Uh, uh, the elevator number is 179981, and I noticed that the permit uh, was 
issued in March of 2019 and supposed to expire until April, in April of 2019. It was a temporary use permit, and that's more than three years expired now, and I'm concerned about that, and I think that the elevator needs to be inspected again. Thank you. I'm sure that staff are listening and will follow that up. Um, the next uh, speaker during uh, open forum is Tara Trim, uh, who will speak via Zoom. Do we have Ms. Trim? Not there. Hmm? Oh, she's muted. Oh, uh, Ms. Trim, can you unmute yourself? We can't hear you. I think we'll, we'll, uh, why don't we move to our next speaker and then once we get this technical issue sorted out, we'll see if we can hear from her. Um, our next speaker for open forum is Stephen Davis. Mr. Davis. Good evening. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the superintendent for speaking on Egg Wars. Uh, I'm a new resident to Palo Alto, and we live quite near to Greer Park, and um, we're kind of shocked and horrified by um, the eggs getting thrown on our sidewalks and fortunately not hitting any cars or houses. Uh, two, um, I'd actually like to offer you all a save the date kind of card, which is hopefully on December, December, uh, October 19th, we're uh, trying to uh, finalize a campaign forum for the school board candidates focused on special education and disability issues. Uh, I hope you can attend whether you are uh, running or not. Um, next. Um, uh, I am kind of the embodiment of a privileged guy. I'm got not a lot of hair, I'm older, <laughs> and I'm white. Uh, and uh, I know when I, I don't have privilege, and I've been feeling a lot of it in a micro way um, as a parent of kids with, with disabilities. Uh, last year, uh, while our general ed classes uh, could communicate together with the other parents uh, through Constella, um, the special ed classes couldn't. Um, this year, and actually I don't even remember from last year, the special ed teachers weren't included in back to school night. Um, very awkwardly, since we had a super special ed teacher, uh, Min, at Fair Meadow last year, uh, special ed teachers were not included in parent appreci uh, teacher appreciation week. So I was busy, there was no table on which to provide her uh, with presents and no organization to support that. Um, strangely, uh, credentialed special education instructors or something are called that as opposed to teachers or special ed te teachers, which kind of implies to me, and I don't know this from the inside, uh, kind of a different status for teachers who are credentialed. Um, I saw that even in the uh, description of what was going on in the um, uh, class uh, teacher skill development day, how, the, how that was being described for them versus all the other teachers. Uh, and um, both at my school and other schools, we've had uh, problems with disability parking. Um, uh, yesterday and today, uh, school sh shuttle bus groups are, um, uh, after school shuttle bus groups are using the, the shuttle dis disabled parking spots. Uh, I ask that the board take this seriously. Uh, I'll be talking a little bit more on this later, but I really think we need a district advisory committee on special education and disability. Thank you. Thank you, and it sounds like there's one or two issues for staff to follow up on that, and the, the parking definitely I heard. Um, uh, let's return to uh, Tara Trim, uh, commenting on Zoom. Oh, or in person, no. Yes. Good evening. I had to fly over here, so not exactly an entire. 
Um, let's see. I have. All right. Can you hear me now? All right. Hello, my name is Tara Trim. I have two kids that are attending this district. One is in first grade, and the other is in junior high at Fletcher. Um, the first grader is going to attending Nixon. I'm here tonight because I live in a community that I watch every day in the morning. We all leave in a ginormous community, traveling to Nixon, as well as going over to Fletcher, as well as going over to Gunn, and we drop our kids off, and it's a process. Um, with Nixon, they have different areas where they try to make it um, comfortable as possible for parents to drop off their kids, but this bus, not having a bus schedule or having a bus period to utilize within the community has been a great, ginormous inconvenience. Um, the parents are pretty much um, over at Fletcher School. There, I could show you pictures where we're literally parked upon each other, where we're just leaning against each other. Um, you sit in your car for hours at a time, sometimes an hour and a half, sometimes two hours, because the, the hours for Nixon School compared to Fletcher School is completely different. Um, Nixon gets out on Monday, Tuesday, at 2.10, and then you have them getting out at um, 1.10, as well as, it's just a different schedule is what I'm getting to. So I have to go from Nixon Elementary School and then go to Fletcher School, and I'm waiting, and I'm waiting, and I'm waiting. This is taking so much time from my day. I think I spend about two hours making up the time just to give back to my job. My job has been trying to be so flexible with me but I am a single parent right now. I'm trying to work my best, my hardest to get things done. I don't have any support. I don't have any subsidy. There's nothing else coming other than my one income. I have these two kids that I take care of day and night and this school schedule in regards to the bus not being available is just a huge inconvenience. I don't have anyone that I can lean on and say, hey, can you take my kid to school for me? Or can you pick my kid up from school for me, and it's, it's hurting. I don't know how much longer I could keep this up without falling on my face. I need this bus schedule. I really need this bus schedule. It's worked out. It's been a huge convenience for me to have that bus. Whatever it is that needs to be done, I am happy to support. I'm happy to just jump in. Ms. Beat Kenra, that your time has expired. Thank you very much okay. for your Thank comments you. and thank all of our speakers for the input that they are providing. Um, the next item on our agenda is the approval of the consent calendar. Uh, items on the consent calendar are approved uh, all at once with no discussion. If any member of the board or member of the public wants to comment on uh, item on the consent calendar, then we pull the item and um, move it to the uh, action agenda. I don't have any comments on the consent calendar from members of the public. Um, is there a motion or comment from board members on uh, items that you want to pull? I move the consent calendar as presented. So the consent calendar is moved and seconded. Uh, student board members, preferential vote. Aye. Aye. Board members, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The consent calendar is adopted uh, unanimously. Um, the next item on our agenda is item 6A, uh, which is um, a public hearing on sufficiency of instructional materials uh, resolution. I'm going to hold a brief public meeting, and then we'll move to discussion of the item and any public comment. Uh, so I'm opening the um, public hearing on uh, instructional materials resolution number 12. 22-23.03, and I am closing the public meeting on that resolution. And uh, then I will turn uh, to Dr. Austin um, to kick us off on this item. Ms. Darcy to Ms. Brown for a very brief statement. Yes, good evening. This is a 
continuing regular item, and we have no complaints against uh, our sufficiency of materials. We have sufficient materials for every student. Okay, we don't have any members of the public who want to comment on this item, board members. Uh, so is there, so uh, we will uh, take this item up for approval at our next uh, uh, board meeting. Uh, the next item on our agenda then is item uh, 7A under staff reports. Uh, and 7A is special education uh, organization and support systems. Um, Dr. Austin. I'll take this one. So I'm gonna bring up our, our co-directors. Um, Ms. Boyce, Ms. Perez, and while they're coming up, I'd like to set expectations for tonight. Tonight is, is not a comprehensive report by any means. We have a written background report. This is a uh, relatively brief um, snapshot report just early in the fall. I think we've waited in the past too long to have a first look at special education. We have ongoing uh, work that we're doing in this area and uh, tonight, not only are we going to share some of the high points, we're going to share some things that we're struggling with a little bit and uh, how we're planning on moving forward. Thank you. Good evening, board. Um, Superintendent Austin, executive um, cabinet. My name is Cynthia Loling Perez. I'm the director of special ed for the district. And I'm joined today by my co-director and partner, Amanda Boyce, who is our director of special educational services and integrated sur uh, supports. We will be presenting to you tonight our department's organization and support system, along with updates regarding our um, focus area for the PAUSD Promise. Good evening, board. So the past few years, our special education department was divided in two divisions. There was elementary and secondary. Last year, we began our restructuring efforts, and we're proud to announce that this school year, our special education department and teams support all special ed students in PUSD from preschool to post-secondary ages 3 to 22. So our department consists of two directors, program specialists, coordinators, a behavioral uh, health, a behavioral support manager, and a mental health manager. All of our team members support individual students and sites, and this reorganization will allow our team to grow with our students and help support the transitions between the different levels and between the programs so that our supports are consistent. In anticipation of the reorganization, Ms. Lelang Perez and I visited 16 sites last spring to learn more about our varied programs and needs across our district. We met with site administrators, psychologists, teachers, and we considered the successes and challenges of our programs in order to determine next steps. We are continuing frequent vi site visits this fall and conversations with staff. Our team is very excited about the reorganization of our department and the partnerships with our schools, families, and our ed services department. As mentioned, one of the focus areas of the PA is the promise is special education and inclusion. Uh, there are three main sections in this focus area, which are program and services, uh, procedural compliance, and parent engagement. The first area, program and services, focus on the provision of standard aligned curriculum and materials, full continuum of support and services, professional learning opportunities for teachers and classified staff, and also development of standard aligned or based IEP goals and accommodation. Under this main focus, we did have some accomplishments. Um, in the school year 2020-2021, uh, our department developed and, and implemented the in, intensive indi individualized uh, program serving students with severe social emotional um, disabilities. In addition to this program, the department also developed and implemented an intensive Something that we have. I, I can touch that. Uh, Ms. Ms. Boyce touched it, but it was quick and a lot of other information. Uh, I asked the team to do that in the spring, and they came back and said, nope, we'd rather do it in the fall so that we can get something right now. So that will be going out to families in the fall okay. this year. Yeah, I think that's a, a great idea. And I hope that you're able to, to the extent possible, model it on the one that we did five years ago, because what would be especially illuminating is seeing how things have changed or not changed from um, what we found five years ago. 
Um, okay, that would that'd be great. I, I found that one of the more illuminating things I've, I've pieces of information I've gotten sitting here for the last five years. Um, the other, uh, what was the other question I had? Oh, I, I just wanted to maybe observe, maybe there's a question here. It, the, per, the percentage of kids, the large number of kids that are had formerly had out of district placements, I assume mostly NPSs or, or private placements that are, I'm, I just am flabbergasted at how much that number has come down. And I just wanna make sure I understand kind of what the drivers of that are, like what programs, and we did, and we have talked about this. I remember a pre-pandemic, uh, you know, group of teachers standing at the podium talking about the programs we were gonna launch that we're gonna address specifically this problem. I can't tell you how many podium addresses I've, that we've received that three years later or four, five years later, the things were exactly the same as they were as before. And so I'm, I'm you know, I wanna make sure I really understand is this really a result of that initiative to bring, uh, create new programs internally? I think Ms. Lillian Perez will be the best to address this. Sure. Um, so yes, so we have, we have a, we're able to bring back kids because we opened up our intensive uh, individualized program, but also we're able to prevent kids from going because of the um, the amount of support they're receiving. So you're right. A lot of the 99 from three years ago was um, students through a settlement agreement or non-public school placement or residential treatment centers as well, and also the creation of a robust um, mental health and wellness uh, department is also, um, well, it, we partnered with them closely last year, but it's also now partnering even more this coming school year should help even lessen that. We're anticipating the numbers to be in the 20s um, by the end of this school year. Uh, because we also opened our own therapeutic program where we're able to bring kids back from, let's say, Esther B. Clark or uh, kids coming out of residential treatment center. So our team has done a really good job also partnering with parents and, you know, understanding the needs of the kids. So that's great. Stay, stay there. Because um, the, the one thing I want to make sure of is that we're not, I mean, the other way to achieve that is to just tell people no on outside placements, even though they may, the child may, the best place for the child may be an MPS. Are we telling people no more than we have in the past? We are working through, we still have to consider what um, parents are asking us. However, we are working through it through and Amanda has done a really good job with ADR, Alternative Dispute Resolution, where we work with parents and look at other options within the district um, so that we can, again, um, shrink that number um, of sending out. Um, so there is a nicer way of saying no. <laughs> um, we are really working hard to partner and gaining that trust that we really needed to gain the past Gosh, this is, Rika said this is my fourth year here. So, you know, we're slowly gaining the trust of families. Um, and so that, that's playing a big role in the, the, um, the number of, um, you know, the, the amount of uh, settlement agreements or um, um, outside placement. I, I mean, I, I think that's really great. Um, I, you know, as a parent of a special needs child, Having your child in the district, if the child can be served in the district, is really a meaningfully difference from the family's perspective. I mean, it's, it's integration with the community. It's logistically 100 times easier. Um, it's just a way better solution if you're able to provide the program that mm -hmm. meets the needs of the, of the child and the family. So, you know, my hat's off to you. I think that's really great that we've been able to accomplish that. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Brianza. Um, thank you all, Ms. Yamamoto, thank you for your work with CAC. Um, it is a, a gem in our community and we're, we're so lucky for your work and looking forward to Sunday. Um, I just wanted to um, just acknowledge that while you all acknowledged we still have work to do, um, doing looking at systems and looking at our organization, I think really just in the things you all mentioned, address so many concerns that, that I've heard from families and 
knowing how cumbersome a process can be and how much information there can be, especially if, if there's a language barrier or whatnot, to be adding lots of information to the website of how the process works, I think is really, really beneficial to families and makes it, they don't, they don't have to catch everything when they're in a conversation with you. There's a place they can go and really um, better understand the process. Um, so I just wanna thank you all for making the progress that you've made. Um, and I look forward to seeing how we hire all those aides that we need and, <laughs> and solve that problem. Any other uh, comments or questions from board members, uh, student board members? Okay, thank you so much for your um, presentation. Um, uh, thank you for the progress you've made um, on the reduction of uh, students who have to leave the district for services. Um, and uh, I also appreciate the acknowledgement that there's a distance to go. I think Mr. Davis's data may be a couple of years out of date, but clearly we still have a distance to travel in order to close the gaps that we're all aware of. So I appreciate that uh, feedback as well. Um, so thank you so much and look forward to hearing uh, the, the next report from the special education department. Um, the next item on our agenda is uh, 7B um, uh, relating to the PAUSD promise and uh, early literacy. Um, Dr. Austin. I would love to start by just talking and talking about how excited I am about some of these results, but I'm not going to. I'm just going to say, uh, <laughs> I think you just did. <laughs> well, I'm not done yet. I'm not done. Uh, Tonight, hopefully, we can we can celebrate a little bit. We are not celebrating victory. We're celebrating progress in an area where our district has not had great progress in the past for a long time. And um, I think when you put some focus and you get a result, it's it's worth taking a moment and and tipping a hat, acknowledging we still have plenty to do. But I'm going to turn this over to Miss Brown and then Miss Reynolds. Thank you, Dr. Austin. Tonight we are sharing an update on our progress indicators one and two of our Every Student Reads initiatives. Last June we shared an update on progress indicator number three. As a reminder, that goal was to have all K through five students in our designated focus groups increase the percentage of students reading at or above grade level by 5% on the BAS local assessment. We shared that two of the six groups met the targeted goal with one group decreasing by 2%. Tonight, Ms. Reynolds, our Director of Literacy, will share the results of Progress Indicator 1 and 2 goals, which are based on the SBAC assessment achievement in reading and ELA overall from last year. Ms. Reynolds. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Good evening, board members. Tonight's presentation celebrates elementary education's focus on early literacy, high-quality, research-based reading pedagogy, analyzing and shifting systemic practices, providing equitable instruction, and creating environments where historically underserved students thrive across all elementary schools. Progress Indicator 1 results are as follows. Educational Services is thrilled to share that third grade students in all Every Student Reads Initiative student groups exceeded the 3% increase in reading on Smarter Balanced Assessment this year. All student groups exceeded the goal. All of them <laughs> exceeded the goal. Could you say that one more time? One more? Would you like one more? All Every Student Reads Initiative student groups in third grade exceeded the reading goal that we set of 3%, they exceeded it. <laughs> the last column you will see indicates the 4% increase for this year, the 22-23 school year for this Progress Indicator 1 goal. Let's take a moment and recognize the work of our students, our educators, and principals as reflected in this substantial growth our Hispanic Latino students improved by 9%. Socioeconomically disadvantaged students uh, jumped by 16%. Socioeconomically disadvantaged Hispanic Latino students grew by an impressive 29%. English learners who have been in the United States for 12 months or more 
also increased and exceeded the goal by 4%, and our students with disabilities jumped 16% in reading as well. You can keep looking, it's so exciting. <laughs> This growth is a direct result of the intentional focus of our teachers and principals dedicated to shifting instructional practices. This includes focusing on foundational skills, implementing the Orton-Gillingham methodology last year, and our teachers continue to engage students in vocabulary, fluency, and comprehension lessons. These are all crucial elements for our students to become proficient readers. Elementary students can access special, excuse me, elementary students can access specific online programs for reading practice as well, and designated students receive online accessibility tools. Educators providing students with books of interest, representative texts, and teaching content that builds background knowledge and academic vocabulary while addressing the PAUSD promise goals of equity and inclusion wellness and safety, celebrating others, right? All of those pieces, including healthy attendance, all put together have helped us exceed our goal in progress indicator one. Let's take a look at one of our schools of particular note. 100% of the third graders at this school <laughs> nearly met or exceeded grade level standards in reading and we're so excited to acknowledge Barron Park Elementary School tonight. It's okay if you want to clap for them. <laughs> Progress Indicator 2, SBAC English Language Arts, comprises of four areas. Reading, which is our Progress Indicator 1, writing, listening, and research inquiry. The overall score is representative of these four claim areas. Half of the third grade every student reads initiative students with scores met or exceeded our goal in English language arts. The last column indicates our 4% increase for the 22-23 school year. Let's celebrate these outstanding students and their growth. We have 12% growth made by our socioeconomically disadvantaged students. There's a strong 9% increase for our socioeconomically disadvantaged Hispanic Latino students, and a 32% growth made by our Black or African American students in English language arts. 12%, 9%, and 32% growth. Results for our Hispanic or Latino students and English learners remain relatively flat compared to the pre-pandemic 2018-19 baseline, and students with disabilities decreased by 3%. Analysis and increased focus on each claim area within the English language arts strand will make a difference. Reading growth for these student groups is anticipated by implementing the iReady Diagnostic Reading Assessment and classroom teacher instruction in Benchmark Advance Adelante. Reading specialists, English learner specialists, and education specialists have Benchmark Advance programs that align with grade level reading lessons, which creates a seamless instructional model to address the unique needs of these student groups. Educational Services has replaced the Benchmark Assessment System, or the BAS, with the iReady Diagnostic Reading Assessment. In October, baseline results from this assessment and an update, updated goal for progress indicator three will be presented to the Board of Education. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Randall. Uh, thank you, Ms. Randall. Any questions? You're welcome. Ms. Brown. Uh, any other uh, staff comments before we uh, turn to public comments? Uh, we have one uh, comment from a member of the public. Um, that's Nicole Chu Wong, uh, and you'll have three minutes. Thank you. A big and important part of building a healthy culture 
I think, is celebrating progress and um, acknowledging it. And so I just want to acknowledge the amazing progress that I know was very hard won and took the really, really hard work of our teachers and staff to accomplish. And I'm really glad that we're doing it at the grade level that we are because I have seen firsthand through volunteer work in a high school in a much less privileged community where it was predominantly Latinx. And I saw 10th graders that weren't reading at grade level. And the work we did to try to change that would take a lot more. The best time for us to close the achieving gap is earlier. And so although obviously there's much harder work, more hard work to do, I'm very encouraged and I find this to bring me a lot of hope that we can do it as a district. So thank you to the teachers and staff and everyone that supported this. It's really important work. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, uh, comments or questions from uh, board members? Um, Mr. Collins? Um, thanks for that report. I don't, I don't see uh, Danae anymore. Oh, there you are. Hey, thank you. Thank you for the report. Um, and, you know, congratulations to everybody on the great results. I, I particularly wanted to, um, I, the results, improved student achievement only comes from actions of teachers. I mean, everything else the rest of us do, everybody in this room who, you know, is an administrator or a principal or uh, you know, or, or anything else other than a, you know, sitting in a classroom in front of 25 eager faces, um, you know, is all just in support of that. And we only succeed or, or fail to succeed if the, depending on what the teachers actually do at the end of the day. And clearly the, our teachers delivered. Um, so I just wanted to really make sure there was a, I don't, I don't know if there are any teachers here tonight or, uh, and I don't know if, I hope there are some teachers listening, but I just wanted to make sure that we recognize that that was the thing that made the difference, is that our teachers, you know, took the challenge and rose to the occasion and were able to help our students succeed to the extent that we know that they're able to. So thank you to all the teachers that participated in that and thank you even more because I know this year is more hard work with new curriculum and new assessment tools and it's always something new. So I, I really appreciate the, the effort that our teachers have made and hope that we can continue to to succeed the way we've succeeded this year. Thank you. Mr. Branza. Thanks. Um, most people in this room know what I think about the CASP. <laughs> um, I think that it is, it is, it gives us some information. It is certainly not a complete measure. It is one of the measures we use. The state requires it and we have, um, you know, listed it as one of our indicators. Um, so while I don't think it's the end all be all, certainly in pat many, many times I have sat up here and I have seen CASP data that has left us disappointed and left us really demanding better. Um, and coming out of the pandemic with us back really fully in person for the first time last year and many of our teachers piloting lots of new things um, and us incorporating new measures and new assessments and new curricula and you know everything else, um, we made significant progress. And so I, I really just wanna, wanna celebrate that, that you know, when, we can, when we can really come down hard on our administration, it, when they don't make progress, we have to celebrate when you do make progress. Um, and, and you really did. Um, so it's, it's really great to see, obviously more work to do, but if you keep up at this, at this clip, um, we're, gonna, we're gonna see, we're gonna close that opportunity gap. And, and that's really what we're here for. So um, thank you to everyone, to all the teachers, to the principals, to our admin, um, to you, Ms. Reynolds, and you, Ms. Brown, and everyone else. Um, it's really something to be celebrated. So thank you. Mr. Durant. Um, just to echo my, my colleagues, you know, this, these, these results would be laudable under any other set of circumstances, but coming out of the pandemic and the anticipated potential learning loss to see this progress, um, it, as Mr. Collins said, it, it goes to the commitment of the teachers, it goes to the commitment of Ms. Reynolds, <laughs> our, all of our administration, and, and the entire team that was able to implement the, the direction. So, you know, it's not a victory, as, as Dr. Austin pointed out, because there's always room to, to grow, and that was pointed out in some of the slides, but it's huge progress to be celebrated and, and also to continue to give us momentum to keep going in the direction. So. I hope everyone 
knows that the board is very supportive, as, as you've heard of, of the direction that you've gone and the results that, that have come out of it. So uh, thank you. Ms. Latimer. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for this report and congratulations. Um, yes, as Dr. Austin said, this is not a victory lap. Uh, educational justice is about so much more than test scores and we have a lot more work to do. Um, but that being said, as far as I know, this is the first time in the history of our school district that we have seen improvements like this. Um, and I think sometimes when we talk about equity and the opportunity gap and we debate priorities and metrics, I think we can lose sight of the fact that real children are at stake every day and they, they don't, you know, we don't have to be perfect to do a whole lot better by them. Um, and so for me, the bottom line is that dozens of kids learned to read in our schools last year who wouldn't have before. Um, and I really can't think of anything more deserving of celebration than that. So Ms. Reynolds and back there and Ms. Brown, um, I really hope you take a moment to exhale and allow yourselves to feel proud and celebrate those kids and their teachers, because at the end of the day, as Mr. Collins said, the teachers did this work. Um, it, was their, it was their commitment to and belief in and partnership with their students. That's the reason we have so much to celebrate right now. Um, and they really, they all deserve a standing ovation. I think if they were here, we'd probably give them one. Um, and I, I do wanna say, I know that this initiative was and it continues to be a big ask. Um, and the asks keep coming, don't they? Uh, there's gonna, it's a lot going on with ELA in our district lately. And not all of it has been comfortable, to say the least. And what I really wanna point out, because it feels really relevant to this item, um, is that the reason there's a lot going on is because the perspective of our district has finally shifted. Um, my colleague, Ms. DiBrienza, has said up on this dais countless times, our system is designed to get the results that it's getting. So if we want different results, we have to change the system. Um, to use a very Silicon Valley expression, everyone in PAOSD is not always gonna agree about the specifics of what systemic change looks like or when or what to prioritize. But for the first time ever, as an organization, we are seeing our failure to educate certain groups of students as a feature of our system and not a bug. Um, and I, I really can't overstate how significant that perspective shift is. It has taken decades for us to get here and to really find the humility to admit that we are the problem, not the kids, and to begin reimagining how we might do things better. And this initiative is part of that reimagining. Um, and from where I sit, I think my colleagues would all support this. These results are an unequivocal validation that the children have never been the problem. And so while they make me really happy, they also make me pretty sad because our students could have been doing this all along. Um, and what I hope this means is that PAUSD will never again doubt the ability of even one child to learn. I grew up here, I attended these schools, I now have four kids in these schools and I've been on this board for two years. Um, and it's my strong belief that hubris has always been our fatal flaw. Uh, it's kept us averse to risk taking, I think, and to self critique and to innovation. And this is finally starting to change to the tremendous benefits of our students, which this report has shown us today. So I guess my challenge to all of us in this room, starting with myself, but also my colleagues and Dr. Austin and staff and everybody at every level in this district is to take the results of this first year, not as a sign that we have solved early literacy or equity or that we have all the answers now, but as a reason to double down on the humility that got us here. And if we do that, that I agree with my colleagues, I, I have no doubt that the results for the next two years are gonna be even more impressive. So I just wanted to put in that plug and that congratulations. Thank you everybody.
This is really exciting. Other comments, questions, student board members? Um, I, I, I definitely want to echo the uh, congratulations and appreciation uh, for these results. It, um, I've, I've been involved in setting a lot of uh, targets that didn't get met, didn't necessarily even get uh, checked <laughs> uh, a year or two later. Um, and uh, I think getting in the habit of setting goals and then meeting them um, uh, and therefore taking them more seriously because I think people, you know, if, if, there, if, if we can set goals and succeed, then I think we're going to pay more attention to those goals because it feels good to succeed and to exceed them. So I think you've not only made progress against these goals, but you've kind of starting to develop the organizational muscle that will help us uh, uh, meet and exceed other goals. Um, it, since I'm in my last few board meetings, you're going to hear these ruminations occasionally on <laughs> what I've seen. Um, and I think that one of the very positive developments um, that I've seen on my time in the board is, is a reduction of um, kind of inconsistency and um, chaos in the district's management and focus. And I think we have a really strong uh, management team extending from uh, senior leadership um, into our programmatic supports, um, like the support that Ms. Ms. Reynolds is providing, and, and to our um, uh, teaching staff, who, as Mr. Collins points out, are, are um, the, the folks who actually do the work. And I, I think that's a, a, a great asset and a great resource and it enables us to set goals and achieve them. Um, and so I, I, I think that it, it, it was unfortunate that, I mean, one of the many things that was unfortunate about COVID is that it kind of interrupted our ability to benefit from that because we, I think, had achieved that and then it paid off in COVID, but it, you know, didn't give us the chance to pay off in, in these more lasting goals. Um, but I think we're at the point where we have the, the, the management ability and now some demonstrated success. And I think that's going to produce a virtuous cycle of achievement, which I think is a terrific um, asset for the district. And I'm calling it out because I want people to see that and to see that that's a value that we should be focused on preserving uh, as, as we move forward. So thank you for this success. Thank you for the example of success. Um, and I look forward uh, to more of them. I'm excited to see the 4% increasing goals because that gets us closer to closing the gaps that we have been focused on for so long. So I look forward to reading about that success in the paper uh, next year. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, that concludes that item. Um, the next item on our agenda is um, information items. These items are um, uh, not set for individual discussion or staff presentations, but they're uh, taken as a group, and if any uh, members of the community, there are none listed, want to comment on them, they can do that, and um, board members can also comment or ask questions on any or all of these items. Mr. Collins. Uh, I just have a brief comment on item C, the board calendar of items. But just following up on my comment um, from last time, which Mr. Dauber, I don't know if you watched the meeting, but um, was that uh, a request to include uh, and schedule out a, um, all the um, PAUSD promise follow-up items in that calendar and to get a good cadence of those set so that we know as a board that we're going to be reviewing those things predictably and we don't have to remember and try to uh, make sure that we get an appropriate number of uh, looks at things. And so I wanted to thank Dr. Austin and, and Mr. Dauber and Mr. Drop if they were involved in it. Um, or uh, who's the board? Oh, Mr. The Brianza. Yeah. That's yeah. Sorry. Mr. Dauber and Mr. Brianza. I'm, I'm, confusing my vice presidents. Um, uh, if you were involved in it as well, because it looks like that, that uh, list has been filled out now, and um, we can look forward to a steady diet of PAUSD promise reviews through the course of the year. So thank you to all the people who were involved in that. Okay, and I, thanks to Dr. Austin and Mr. Brenza, because I wasn't at that meeting. It sounds like it, I accomplished things. <laughs> That's excellent. <laughs> Anybody else? Uh, yes, Mr. Pan. 
Yeah, um, I was supposed to bring this up during my student report, but I've kind of forgot. Um, but I'd like to address something related to um, 8A. So it is the Title IX update. Mm -hmm. um, our gun Title IX club is um, planning on having a domestic violence um, school supply shelter drive um, in the first two weeks of October. Um, so I just wanted to report that. I was supposed to do that during the student report, so I'm sorry about that. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, then let us move on to um, item uh, nine, which is board operations. Any reports from board members? Mr. Brianza? Oh, Mr. Brianza. Yeah, I get the pick. Uh, well, I just said during board operations, every meeting I was going to try to, uh, you know, build someone up and acknowledge some great stuff. And one of the fun things about trying to do this is that the hard part isn't finding someone to celebrate, it's picking what to say because there's so much good stuff going on. Um, but I think this week particularly... Uh, all of the administration and staff from Gunn and Pally last Friday, um, they all worked like a 17 hour day and it did not end easily. Um, and it's, it's not particularly rare, I think, for them to have a 17 hour day, right? During football season, they all stay all night. There's weekends they come in, just a lot of long, long days. Um, so I just wanna acknowledge the, the Pally and Gunn admin and staff for all of their work last Friday from early in the morning to get through the whole school day through the end of that football game. Uh, Mr. Collins. Uh, I had a request for my colleagues, which is, um, I think it was prior to the pandemic, we had a, uh, we had developed for a little while a tradition of doing reports on our subcommittee meetings. I knew you were going to say this. <laughs> there you go. I'm predictable, <laughs> if nothing else. Um, and which I found particularly useful because otherwise most of these committees, sometimes you, you never hear like city school liaison, you often don't hear what goes on in the meetings and it's, while well, you can go and find the minutes and watch the meeting, that it'd be much nicer to get a two paragraph report that just says, hey, we met and this is what we talked about. So, um, and some of these meetings, you know, BPRC, I think we see the fruit of your labor you on a pretty work. regular <laughs> basis. So I don't think we need a report from that, <laughs> but you know, the equity committee, which I'm on um, and the property committee awesome. and the and the city school liaison committee are all committees that meet fairly regularly and, and probably it would be good both for transparency for the board members and for the community at large if we get a just a very brief report on what happens uh, when those things meet. So just a request that I have for, for my colleagues. University of city school liaison and I will try to document. <laughs> and uh, one possibility that we could discuss is just adding a standing agenda item which is committee reports which don't necessarily need to be written um, if uh, we can get oral reports uh, if there are any writing. Yeah. So that's something we can discuss at a uh, agenda setting. Mr. Duroff, did you want to speak? I was just going to say that the last time Mr. Collins brought this up, I was very supportive. I was also chairing four committees at the time. And so it was, it was, <laughs> it was onerous and I'm, so I'm even more supportive now that I'm not chairing any committees <laughs> that uh, the chair should certainly report on the activities <laughs> of the committee. Okay. Any, anything else? Okay, uh, that is our last item, so this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>